All right, folks, let's take a look at chapter 16. We'll get started here. So we've got five uh, sections of this uh, chapter, so we'll uh, take them one by one. And here's your first question. In the late 19th century, the United States experienced perhaps the fastest and most far-reaching economic revolution in history. Abundant natural resources, a growing labor supply and market for manufactured goods, and new capital for investment all fostered massive economic expansion. The federal government also spurred industrial and agricultural development by enacting tariffs protecting U.S. industry from foreign competition, giving land to railroads, and using the army to remove Indians from western lands wanted by farmers and mining companies. Every region except the South saw a rapid expansion of manufacturing, mining, and railroad construction, ending an earlier America based on small farms and artisan workshops. By 1913, the United States produced a third of the world's entire industrial output. Half of all industrial workers labored in plants with more than 250 employees. By 1890, two-thirds of Americans worked for wages, making dreams of economic independence, like owning a farm or workshop, unattainable for most. Between 1870 and 1920, a new working class developed, with 11 million Americans moving from farm to city and 25 million immigrating from overseas. Most new jobs were in industrial cities whose rapid growth was best symbolized by New York, a city whose banks and stock exchange financed railroads, mines, and factories, thus sponsoring industrialization and westward expansion. The Great Lakes region was the center of industrialization with iron, steel, machinery, chemicals, and food production in large cities like Pittsburgh and Chicago and countless smaller cities. Railroads enabled the second industrial revolution. Private investment in huge grants of land and money by federal, state, and local governments tripled the number of miles of rail between 1860 and 1880 and tri tripled it again over the next 40 years. This opened vast new areas to commercial farming and created a national market for manufactured goods. By the 1890s, five transcontinental railroad lines carried western mine, farm, ranch, and forest products to markets in the east, which in turn made factory goods for the west. In 1883, the major companies divided the nation into the four time zones still in use today. Railroads were so critical to economic growth in the national market that financial crisis in the rail industry directly shocked the entire national economy. An expanding population became an ever larger market for mass production, mass distribution, and mass marketing of goods, all of which are the basis of modern industrial economy. National brands, national stores, and mail order firms such as Sears Roebuck and Company emerged for the first time serving rural communities across the United States. Extraordinary technological innovations helped quicken communications and economic expansion. Telegraph lines crossed the Atlantic to Europe, and the telephone, typewriter, and handheld camera began to be used in the 1870s and 1880s. Thomas A. Edison's inventions, such as the phonograph, light bulb, and motion picture, revolutionized private life, public entertainment, and economic activity. Edison also created systems for distributing electric power, and soon entire cities had electricity for homes, factories, and streetcars. Electricity enabled industrial and urban growth by providing a more dependable and useful source of power than water or steam. The newly invented electric motor, developed by Serb immigrant Nikola Tesla, harnessed the power of this innovation for industry and households. Economic growth was remarkable, but quite volatile, with markets inundated by goods and federal monetary policies that removed money from the national economy and reduced prices. A series of severe economic recessions and depressions occurred, notably in the 1870s and 1890s. Businesses competed ruthlessly. To stabilize prices and profits, railroads and other companies formed pools to divide markets and fix prices and trusts that allowed a single director to manage the affairs of several competing companies. But the drive to compete often quickly disintegrated such schemes. Competition led some firms to control their entire industry by buying out the competition. Economic concentration culminated in the Great Merger Wave from 1897 to 1904, in which 4,000 companies were incorporated into larger corporations that served national markets and thus wielded immense power. Giant corporations appeared, such as Standard Oil, International Harvester, and U.S. Steel, which was formed in 1901 out of eight large steel firms by the financier J.P. Morgan. With no personal or corporate income taxes, some businessmen accumulated massive wealth and economic power. One sub such captain of industry was Andrew Carnegie, who emigrated from Scotland as a teenager and labored as a factory worker and telegraph operator before he used a position with the Pennsylvania Railroad to build a steel empire. 
During the 1870s depression, Carnegie built a vertically integrated steel company, one that controlled every stage of production from raw materials to transportation, manufacturing, and distribution. By the 1890s, Carnegie dominated the steel industry and amassed a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars. His steel factories at Homestead, Pennsylvania were the most technologically advanced in the world. Although Carnegie's upbringing instilled in him a commitment to democracy, social equality, and charity, he ran his factories ruthlessly. More associated with extraordinary wealth was John D. Rockefeller, who rose from being a merchant clerk to an oil industry titan. Through cutthroat competition, he ruined rival oil companies, arranged deals with railroads, and fixed prices in production. He mastered horizontal integration, in which one firm acquires competing firms, but soon established a vertically integrated company, a monopoly that controlled the drilling, refining, storage, and distribution of oil. By the 1880s, Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company controlled 90% of America's oil industry. Such figures and their wealth attracted the admiration and resentment of many Americans. While many rose from modest circumstances, their wealth and their methods for treating workers and conducting business alienated many Americans, who thought their unregulated actions eroded political and economic freedom and damaged democracy. It was contested whether such figures were captains of industry or robber barons. In Wealth Against Commonwealth, his 1894 expose of Standard Oil's manipulation of markets and bribery of legislatures, Henry de Marist Lloyd wrote that liberty and monopoly cannot live together. The benefits of economic expansion were distributed highly unevenly. For a few workers, including skilled workers with some control over production processes, such as miners and iron and steel workers, high wages were the norm. Most industrial workers, however, had semi-skilled jobs that required only managing a machine. These workers had no control over production and were easily replaced and dismissed during a strike or economic downturn. Regular and prolonged unemployment became widespread for these workers, some of whom became tramps, taken to the roads and rail to search for employment. Though American workers earned more than their European counterparts, work was more dangerous in the United States. Between 1880 and 1900, an average of 35,000 workers died each year in factory and mine accidents. Because of a high unemployment and the use of public and private police, most strikes in America failed. Many workers were extremely poor and relied on family to survive. Significantly, working conditions for the increasing number of women workers was deplorable. Reporter Neil Cusack and others compared women's working lives to slavery. Class divisions became more visible in this period with the growing middle class and the excessive wealth of the upper class. The rich began to retreat to their own neighborhoods and build fantastic mansions and estates in the cities and countryside. Meanwhile, a growing number of urban middle class professionals, office workers, and small businessmen moved to urban and suburban neighborhoods and used new streetcars and commuter railways to get to central business districts. By 1890, the richest 1% of Americans received the same total income as the bottom half of the population and owned more property than the remaining 99%. Many wealthy Americans conspicuously led an aristocratic lifestyle characterized by luxury goods, exclusive clubs, colleges, and social events. In dense cities such as New York, the urban poor resided in slums not far from the homes of the wealthy. Writers and historians offered stunning critiques of this contrast. In Thorsten Veblen's The Theory of the Leisure Class, the rich are exposed for spending money solely to flaunt their wealth. By contrast, Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives presents a stunning array of photographs that document the poor's wretched existence in New York City at the end of the 19th century. So, that's the end of our first section. We'll be back for the second one.